So today we're going to start a new series uh, for the new year, and this is Seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. Um, we'll be starting from uh, Genesis 1, verse 1 to 28. So the beginning of all things. Turn with me to Genesis 1, 28. You can follow with me on the screen or on your mobile phones or in, in your Bibles. Uh, before we do that, why don't we look to God in prayer and ask Him to come meet us in His Word. Father, we thank you that Jesus and only Jesus, our one true Savior, only He matters. That He was in the beginning, that He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And we thank you that this new year, on our very first worship service, we can gather again in his name. We thank you that you have called us as your people to turn our eyes away from everything else and look to Jesus and only Jesus. Father, I pray that you will meet with us where we are, wherever we are in our walk with you. We pray for those who could not make it today that for whatever reason and whatever is holding them back, that you would shepherd them. You are their shepherd that you would comfort, strengthen, and empower them. I pray, Father, that you would now turn our eyes away from everything else, captivate our imaginations and our heighten our awareness of your presence. And by your Spirit, I pray that you would show us the beauty and the wonders of your creation and to see you as a supreme and sovereign ruler of the universe that you created. I pray that this familiar passage for some of us will be new in our hearts today as Jesus becomes the center of everything. So hide me now and show Christ to your people so that we may treasure him more. In Jesus' name, amen. So the beginning of all things, Genesis 1, 1 to 28. New Year's Day in Japan last week on the 1st of January was called Ganjitsu or Dantan. Right? Gan means beginning, right? And Tan means uh, day, daybreak. Each year, many Japanese travel to shrines and temples for, to pray for blessings and uh, to pray for favor for the year ahead. But the God of the Bible does not live in temples made by human hands. Uh, in fact, Genesis, the word Genesis is called origin. It's the book of origin. And Moses, who is the author of Genesis, writing sometime in 14, 400 B, 14, 40 BC to 1260 BC, somewhere there, well, he was writing this to show Israel, the people of God, their origins. Remember that Genesis is part of the first five books of Moses, namely the Pentateuch, or what we call, the Jewish people call the Torah. And so Moses is looking back and writing, right? Uh, so from our text, we are going to see that um, God comes first before his creation. Secondly, we are going to see that God's goodness is seen in all his creation. And thirdly, we will see that God made us in his image for his glory. So number one, God comes first before everything we read. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. <coughs> God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Notice verse 1 is so God-centered. Uh, it simply says, in the beginning, God. So pause with me there for a moment before we look into this passage. In the beginning, God. Who existed before anything else existed? God existed. Before creation, there was God, right? God did not have a beginning. No one created this God. He has always been there, right? Every religion has a beginning, but the God of the Bible does not have a beginning. 
Every man-made God had a beginning, but the God of the Bible is not created. He did not have a beginning. He simply is. Going back to Exodus, when God revealed himself to Moses, what did he say? I am. He simply exists. He is. No one created him. He has always been there from eternity past. But the universe had a beginning, right? As we'll see here. God created the universe out of nothing. In the Latin, ex nihilo. Out of nothing, right? Uh, this is the one and only God worthy of worship. This is the one and only God to whom all allegiance is due. This is the one and only God to whom, who alone deserves our attention today, here at the very beginning of this new year, right? There is no other God beside Him. As Isaiah, if we would fast forward a little bit, would look to this God and say, Who can compare Him? <laughs> Who can compare him? There is no God beside you, says Isaiah. Now, does Genesis 1 contradict the scientific evidence of an old earth? Right? Uh, Moses, again, did not write to answer scientific questions. Right? But there are at least, uh, let me say briefly, just for the sake of, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the purpose of uh, letting us know that there are four views on creation. Uh, number one is creationism. Creationism says that God made the universe in six 24 hours, and so the earth is young. This, uh, they actually uh, try to provide counter evidences uh, to the scientific world uh, for why they believe what they believe, and they reject evolution, right? The second is progressive creationism, which says that the days uh, here are not 24 hour periods, but unspecified unspecified time, periods of time, even ages. And this view agrees that there is an old earth, but like creationism, they also reject uh, evolution. Now the third one is theistic evolution or God-guided evolution, uh, which says that the earth that we live in is old and grumpy. They say that God used evolution to create the universe. That is not a view that I have. The fourth view is the view that I have, which is called historical creationism. So why do I hold this view? I will show you from the text in a moment. Uh, but John Salehammer, who is a biblical expert, a Hebrew expert, in, uh, in his book Genesis Unbound holds this view. Right? It is not a new view. It is a very old view, actually. He takes it back to even earlier Jewish scholars uh, who hold this view. And a more prominent theologian today who hold this view is John Piper. Uh, uh, who, who, you know, and earlier than John Piper, many other Jewish scholars hold this view. So historical creationism basically says this, that the Bible has no error, that this account in Genesis 1 is historical, meaning that Adam was not, didn't evolve, that he was a literal Adam that God created. And it also rejects, so it rejects evolution. That's my position. But what about the scientific evidence? And I'm going to show you in a minute why the Bible and science doesn't contradict, okay? No matter how old the earth is, every Christian can celebrate the scientific truth that God allows to be discovered under his universe. We can see God's glory more fully. Let me explain. Notice the word beginning here in the English word. That word in the Hebrew is bereshit or reshit. Okay? Sounds like the Japanese word for resito, right? But reshit. It means an indefinite period of time, not an instant of time. Uh, this is also you same word is used in Genesis 10:10, 10, 10, Job chapter 8 verse 7 and so on. And so it means that the evidence for an old universe does not contradict Genesis 1. Why? Because it says in the beginning God created the entire universe. I don't want to go too technical, but I'll I'll refer to you Genesis Unbound if you want to read that. But in the meantime, let me just say this: that word in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is not the heavens as we see it; it's the universe, it, because in the Hebrew language, it's one word, right? 
uh, Skyland, that's how it is translated in the Hebrew, and it was actually uh, euphemism, euphemism, it's a big word I know, but please bear with me. It's an euphemism in Hebrew language. It means basically that those words mean this, uh, which seems contradictory are the same thing that talks about the universe. And so this, in English language, it would read as, in the beginning God created the entire universe. And after that, now, the six days from verse 2 are an account of something else other than the creation of the universe. Why is that? Look at verse 2. It says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now notice the word Hebrew earth in verse 2. Again, that word earth in the Hebrew and in verse 1, earth in Hebrew are not the same. That one earth in Hebrew is also eretz. It's land. It is not earth as we now know it today. It is a localized place of land, right? So... It is not earth as we now know it, it is called land. In other words, the land where God will put uh, Adam was not yet ready to live in. And so verse 2 says it was formless and void. Now, okay, one more Hebrew word. <laughs> in Hebrew, it's actually not formless and void. See, the reason that guy wrote the book Genesis Unbound is because he says that the English translations are, there's a lot of problem here. And so he goes back to how the Hebrews, right, the Old Testament written, written Hebrew, right? The Hebrew actually read this. So uh, in Hebrew, that means uninhabitable uh, wilderness, like a wasteland where no man can live, right? It doesn't say formless and void. So the six days, six days are talking about how God prepared the land for man. And the land was still deserted and dark. And God, but here's the thing. God is going to turn this piece of this land into a fruitful place for Adam. He's going to turn this into God, the Garden of Eden, which we will see in chapter 2. And that will become the promised land of Abraham and Israelites. This is incredible. It, from the beginning of the world, God was already preparing the promised land where his people will dwell. Right? This is amazing. When I read this, I was amazed that here in Genesis 1, we already see from the beginning God's redemptive plan, plan already in the making. Right? Amazing. So, he said in verse 3, Let there be light, and there was light. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Right? Okay. You may be wondering, okay, that looks simple <laughs> you know but it's not before there was any ancient calendar god called the light day so that man will work during the day the man he will create and he called the darkness night so that the man can rest at night right how many of you can sleep right how many of you have a struggle sleep, struggle sleeping right how many of you struggle with sleeping during the pandemic right how many of you think and worry before, when you go to bed at night, right? See, God did not initially intend for you to be that way when he created the, 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 the universe and the earth and the land that he's creating here, especially the light and the day. He meant for us to rest at night, right? As we will see. Now, there was evening and there was morning the first day. And so, uh, he, I want to ask you this question. If you look at the sky today, it's so blue, it's so beautiful. Because I looked out the window this morning. And my question to you is, when you see a bright, clear daylight, and you say, what a beautiful day, does it stop there? Or do you see the glory of God? Do you go one step further and say, thank you, Lord? This is so important, right? This is so, so important. It says there was evening, there was morning the first day, and God, this was, look, God was there before the first New Year's Day. This was the first New Year's Day. And um, so my question today is, will you start this new year with God first, right? Forgetting 2021, will you start 2022 with God first? Will you start each day that God has created for God, with God? Now, will you go to bed at night this year, enjoying the rest that God has given you and say, thank you for rest. Thank you for everything that you did for me during the day, regardless of what happened. 
thank you for giving me life. Would you say that because we're going to see in a minute he's going to create man, right? See, God created this rhythm of work and rest. He himself will rest on the seventh day after his creation in chapter 2. And all this was written to show us that God comes first before everything. Even before the creation, God comes first. So next we see the goodness of God in his creation. God's goodness is seen in his creation. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate from the waters, from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. This is amazing work. And it was so. And verse 8, God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and there was morning the second day. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. So Moses is now talking about these things that has happened, right? See, God made the waters. Water is a source of life. You say, Pastor Joey, why are you teaching us these you know, simple things in life? Well, uh, how many of you know, many of you know, that the average percentage of water in the human body is how much? Yeah, 60 to 70 percent, right? 70 percent. Incredible. Water is significant. So the tap water in your kitchen is there to show God as a source of life. Right? These are the things that we take for granted. The massive ocean, right? Nihonkai or the Japan Sea or whatever that we see around us is there to display God's majestic glory. It's not just water. Right? And so God created water as a source of life. Water is a source of life. We can't, we will dehydrate if we don't drink water. We will die without water. There are other, many countries around the world where they, they don't have proper drinking water. Poor countries. Right? So God created water and now He's parting the waters from the waters. And there was no violent destructive tsunamis to destroy the land yet. This is perfect. But later, look, God will use water in Noah's time to judge the world in chapter 6, as we will see. So, now, do you see the word God? So, don't take that for granted, huh? When you read your Bible, because God appears 35 times in this chapter. That must say something. <laughs> Moses is trying to say something. And the word heavens appears 21 times. And it was so, appears 7 times. What does it was so means? It was so means it came to be. It happened. Right? It is important not to miss what Moses is saying. This is that this is all about God's glory. The work of a sovereign and powerful God. The entire creation is God's theater in which he displays his majesty and glory. Let me say that again. The entire universe and creation is God's theater in which he shows off his glory <laughs> it is amazing because if you uh, this is so important for us to enjoy God in the normal seemingly boring stuff like water and see God in it that he is a source of life and give thanks for him right and notice the expression God said in verse 6 and verse 9 don't take that for granted God said and it came to be God spoke and it came to be, right? He doesn't need a raw material to create something else. God creates out of nothing. He speaks and they come to be. This is a very, very powerful God, right? This occurs, that word God said occurs 10 times in this chapter. Uh, we see words like, notice, God said, God made, God created, God called, God saw, <laughs> this is God-centered. It's everywhere. So the Genesis account is about God first, not about man. The creation story does not start with God creating man. It starts with God as the center of everything else. Not about water or even the universe. The universe are there to display the God-centeredness of God. <laughs> this is what we need. This is what we were made for originally to see, right? And 
Now, so in verse 11, it says, read with me, And God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit bearing trees, and uh, fruit in which it is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. Right? Verse 12, The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And if you continue reading verse 13 to 19, right? For the sake of time, let's look at this. Now, verses 11 and 12, look at that. God grows vegetables and fruit for men. Because <laughs> I was looking at this, right? And I'm thinking, what? What is this? this text looks, looks kind of boring. <laughs> Forgive me, God. It's very easy to just look at that. And think, oh, what a boring, like this doesn't do anything to me. You're reading your Bible and like, what vegetables and fruit? That seems so ordinary. I pray that's not you because it's very, very e easy to overlook these seemingly small things in our lives, isn't it? Take it for granted. So when I go for a walk with my wife, Giselle, we, uh, I love to go to the park and then just enjoy the trees, not do anything, just enjoy the trees, that's it, right? But Giselle usually has a secret plan, like a hidden plan to go and grab vegetables at the grocery store when we walk. So I don't like that and I said, nah, let's not go to the grocery store, come on, why do we always have to carry a bag? Uh, like, let's just go and enjoy God's creation without carrying anything around. We're always carrying things when we go to blah, 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 blah. And I start to catch myself complaining, right? And so, this is so important. Look, it's very easy to be annoyed at the grocery store when it's crowded. Eh? In Japan, it's so packed during the coronavirus. You're afraid people are going to pass on to you. Everybody's touching the same vegetables. You don't even know if they sneezed over that and whatnot, right? So, and then you're, you're thinking all of these things and you're stressed out. And so, what happens? God wants us to see his goodness in his provision, even in vegetables. What would happen to the vegetation without the light, without good weather, without good soil condition, that the world in which God has created, right? In city centers. So, it's very easy to think that our jobs are more significant than the farmers in rural areas. Huh? Very easy to assume. No, that kind of look, the kind of uh, blindness prevents us from seeing God's good provision. The vegetation, even in frozen vegetables. God wants us to worship Him, even when we carry vegetables in the grocery store with thanksgiving. <laughs> that is the purpose for which God created the, the world and vegetation and plants, not only to provide for man, so that man will give God the glory. Man will see God's goodness in His provision. That man will enjoy God in vegetables. Right? Do, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God, of God, whether you eat or drink, says the Bible elsewhere, right? So God wants us to see His goodness in His provision. Now, look at one more phrase here. It says, God saw that it was good. Verse 12. This appears seven times in, in this passage. Back in verses 4 and 10, it says, God saw that it was good. Here in verse 12, when God created the trees, plants, and vegetation, it says, God saw that it was good. Look at verse 18. When God separated the light from the darkness, it says what? God saw that it was good. Now, down in verse 21, go there. When God created the sea creatures and every living creature, it says what? God saw that it was good. In verse 25, when God created everything, that creeps on the ground, sorry ladies, God created creepy things including co cockroaches, right? Uh, so, uh, when God created everything that creeps on the ground, it says what? God saw that it was good. Wow! When God looked at everything He created, He saw that it was good. The world that He created was good. This is what God wants us to see. He is the source of all goodness in creation. When God first made His creation, everything was good. There was no chaos. There was no sin in it. There was order, structure, and beauty. He created a perfect world, right? The kind of world which all of us want to live in. Is it not? Right? That's why we hear that song, famous song sung by people everywhere. Uh, uh, heal the world, make, make it a better place. 
for me and for everyone. You know, like people sing these kinds of songs because there is a longing in our hearts for a world that is perfect, where there is no sin, where there is no death, where there is no pain, where there is no suffering. And that was the world that God created. A world of fruitfulness and goodness. A world of no decay. This is what we were made for. But, here's the tricky part. Creation is not God. Worshipping sun, the moon, and the stars is idolatry, right? Because these are created things. Many people, how many of you have climbed up to Mount Fuji to see the beautiful sunrise? Only Tina. Right? I have, and I would love to, right? But I'm, if you look at me, I'm not a good climber. You know? I won't make it halfway, right? So many people climb up the top of Mount Fuji to see the beautiful sunrise. Why is it that in our hearts that we are captivated by natural beauty? That why are we so drawn to natural beauty? Aha, I will get there in a minute. But think with me, whenever we take a good thing that God has made and we start to love them more than himself, that's idolatry. That's called idol worship in the Bible. Christians see God's glory and goodness in, even in the sunlight, right? So, how can we be free from this idolatry? Now, take for instance, verse 14. God made light for signs and for seasons. It seems like, what is that? <laughs> These signs and seasons are for marking times of festivals, like the Passover, which the Israelites celebrated in Exodus. Amazing! So God was creating these rhythms so that His people will remember Him in these times and in these seasons that He has created. So God first comes first before creation. He wants us to see His goodness in His creation. And thirdly, God created us in His image for His glory. So, verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth see creeping things so God created man in his image in the image of God he created him male and female I'm thinking of creeping things in Australia you know, lots of lots of wild animals and like some you know so maybe not in the cities, right, Esther? So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him male, male and female. God blessed them. Wow. God spoke a benediction, right? In the church, we speak benediction at the end of the service. God blessed them. He blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. This was God's benediction. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. From the beginning of the time, God was pre going to prepare a people for himself who will multiply his people. He's going to call a nation out of this group, right? B by the time we get to uh, uh, Abraham and so on. And have this dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the living thing that moves on earth. Now, what does it mean to be created in the image of God, right? See, to be created in God's image means we have a mind. We have a conscience, we have feelings and desires, with intelligence and physical action. We reflect God's nature in a way that nothing in creation does. Notice, none of the animals of this earth that God has created were created in His image. But man He created as supreme above the animals. What does that mean? It has a huge implication and we'll get there in a minute. It means this, that the own God has given us an honorable status when He created us in His image. Your life has meaning and purpose and value. If you are confused this, this 2022 about your life, just remember this, uh, today again that God made you in His image. You have a purpose, you have a, your life has a meaning, you have a great value in the sight of God. You are not valuable mainly because of what you do. Because in the Sinti centers, you know, people say, hey, uh, what is your name? And then the next question is what? What do you do? So the, the people define you, your sense of worth and value based on what you do, not based on who you are. But God defines you on the basis of who you are. Your worth and value is defined not by what you do primarily. Man has not done anything up until this point. God had just created him, and he created him in his image. 
That's why you are valuable. You derive your value and your ultimate sense of worth and identity from the Creator God, not by anything that you have done, just